KCAA. It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Last night on the program, we talked about uh, an, an op-ed over at the uh, the New York Times where uh, Magellan found some, some billionaire money funding front groups to influence, well, what the future of our nation is going to look like. And I got a lot of responses from people going, you know, Rick, you're right. This isn't new. And and some people go, you know, this, you know, we've been hearing about these groups for years. And you go, yeah, uh, all of this sprung out of a, well, a Supreme Court justice who ha- wasn't a Supreme Court justice just yet. A guy named Lewis Powell Jr. who wrote this this little memo that, that people talk about, uh, the treatise to save free enterprise. And oddly enough, uh, Powell was, was a you know, moderate Democrat. Um, who wrote this this piece uh, telling business how they could fight off the scourge of socialism and save capitalism, you know, from the, the you know, the, the activism of, of workers wanting to make good wages and, and people wanting to drink clean water and breathe clean air and, and all of those things. And, you know, in tax corporations so that there's a benefit to the community. So what they, what Powell listed was, hey, uh, corporate America, you need to be more politically active. You need to start buying politicians. You need to use your influence, your corporate power, sway that around a bit and let people know that it's you that's in charge and, and change the message. And if I remember right, you know, he, he called for the statesman like some of 10 percent of all corporate profits to go into this kind of activism. Uh, where you create these business alliances, you know, you know, this chamber of commerce and all these these groups to go out there and you know push for the advancement of pro business politi- policies. Because hey, if it's good for business, it's got to be good for for you, right? Uh, also, they they you know, Powell said, hey, we got to we got to do something about education. We're making these these colleges and universities these work these people these workers are getting too smart for their own good. We got to get in there and. Change the hearts and minds, which is why when you look at uh, the economics departments of most major universities, all funded by by billionaires and corporations. Why? So that they can have veto power over who they hire in the economics department. There was a fun story several years back of how the Koch brothers gave Florida State University something like $2 million a year. Um, and for this, this statesman like some... Uh, they had veto power over any economics professor hired. And you go, think about the power that you have by shaping the minds of, of young economists by focusing on, well, the good the good capitalist mentality, uh, where unions are bad, it's just a negative on the balance sheet, it's bad for business. Uh, regulations are job killers, you know, that kind of thinking, instead of, well, a more balanced approach to economics. And they've done that. They've done a masterful job. Many colleges across this country have soul-sucking institutes that, well, preach the benefits of free enterprise and capitalism. Now, look, I I count myself as a capitalist, a New Deal capitalist. I think there needs to be guardrails. I think there needs to be uh, organizations to balance power. Uh, But I think capitalism, I don't want the government making my shoes. But at the end of the day, um, there have to be some some guardrails, which they do not like. Also, the Powell memo called for media influence. You know, you need to get in there and influence those media folks by basically buying them up and and presenting a more favorable view of business and free enterprise and, and do away with all the things that he saw as negative portrayals of business. You know, like workers working long hours in dangerous conditions and dying on the job. You know how many times we hear about the AFL-CIO's death on the job report? Corporate America doesn't like it. Uh, and our corporate media never really covers it. So we don't even know it exists because, again, got to be friendly to business. So when Walmart or any of the big corporations don't like something, they pull their advertising 
And these businesses, these media companies squeal. Okay, we won't do it again. Promise. Which is why you won't hear any real analysis on how bad things are for working people in this country. Congratulations, Lewis. Mission accomplished. Also, uh, he called for legal strategies to defend business interests, challenge regulations, sue government at every opportunity, and push for laws that are, are beneficial. You know, kind of like getting your guy on the EPA, kind of like maybe using you know, an idea to stack regulatory agencies with corporatists who are going to do the work of the corporation, and then the door will swing. They'll go back and forth. You know, kind of like we are. Now, remember, this is 1971 he wrote this. The world that we were living in, the, my grandparents' world, where we were distrustful of corporate America, we held them their feet to the fire, where average pay to CEO to worker pay, like 20 to 1. I look at how well this memo has been the playbook of the conservative right because the think tanks and the research institutes and all of those organizations that this incestual pool of organizations that he called for, wow, major success, starting with the Heritage Foundation, who right now at the center of Project 2025, pushing the next, the next genesis of really bad ideas. And I couldn't help but think about Lewis Powell today because, again, it was all about saving free enterprise, countering uh, you know, what, what they saw as a tax on business and getting corporations more active and, and using corporate activism to counter you know, consumer rights groups, environmental rights groups, labor rights groups, because, hey, hey, those employees, they got it good. And really to have a long-term strategy on how to businesses for them to protect themselves, which means buying our courts, mission accomplished, buying our, our Congress, our, our Senate, our House, the White House, regulatory bodies, all in the interest of making sure that profits, profits are sacrosanct. No one touches the profits. And when, hey, when, when we screw up and the profits go down, oh, please, bail us out. And the thing that bothers me is this has been going on my entire lifetime. And they've done it most of the time in the, in the cover of darkness. Uh, the dark money that flows through the veins of this monster uh, doesn't really get out into public. I think with, if you remember about 10 years ago, when it was discovered that there was something called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which basically was a group that went around to state legislatures and wrote their bills for them, did their homework for them. So, and would wine and dine politicians and, you know, and train them on the ideals and the good, the goodness of business. And what they got in return for the, the tokens that they were throwing out to the SEALs uh, was bad policy for working people. Destruction of workers' comp, destruction of unemployment, tax, a tax code that's rigged for corporations against working people. And you have the world that we're in. So you wonder why working people are angry. You know, because we hear all the reports that the economy is doing well. And for all intent and purposes, it's it's... I saw a thing today said the U.S. economy is the strongest in the world right now. Biden's economy is the strongest in the world. And yet we keep hearing, keep hearing, terrible, sky's falling, we're all starving. And understand, working people are still struggling because we're suffering under 50 years of business attacking labor of business holding down working people, putting their foot on their on the neck of uh, of working people and their ability to get better wages, hours, conditions. And they, they, we've created a word in the economist world, monsopony, which basically means corporate power crushing wages, holding them down. And they do this through you know many ways, but dishonesty being a huge part of it. Uh, which is why when I saw on Twitter yesterday, Stephen Moore, the right-wing economist, uh, put out a tweet of the, tr the Trump versus Biden income showdown. 
And he says, under Trump, households saw a $6,000 rise. Under Biden, households have experienced a $2,000 fall. That's an 8,000 yearly difference. Remember this when you vote. And he puts two graphs next to each other. One, oh, one with, with a grinning Donald Trump, like he, like a possum eating, uh, you know what. And one with a, you know, kind of a grimacing, kind of frowning Joe Biden. And one's going up and one's going down. And you, you kind of get this. Only problem is they just eliminated the year 2020. Uh, there's, there's no 2020. So, uh, the, the Trump years are just, you know, those three where, you know, the, the Obama years were moving us in the right direction. So Trump inherited a decent economy that was moving forward. They heated it up massively with, with a massive stimulus in that tax bill. Cause remember they borrowed, uh, well, how much, how much did Trump borrow during his, his tenure? Something like seven and a half trillion dollars, something like a quarter of all of the wealth that we borrowed. Yeah. Thanks. But this kind of dishonesty, it's what they're known for. It's what they do. And the frustrating part of all this is we keep falling for it because they own the media. They control what we see, hear, and read. When you've got six corporations that control about 90% of what we see, hear, and read, there is a true problem. And I look at this Powell memo, major success. When we come back, we're going to talk about the latest iteration of it right back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So on Thursday, the Office of Personnel Management issued its final version of the regulation meant to safeguard civil service workers from the return of the Trump era Schedule F policy. You've heard me talk about this for months as part of the way to, well, make patronage great again. Well, the, the Biden administration is moving forward on this this new policy uh, that if, if Trump gets back, understand what they want to do. They want to turn the federal government's 2.2 million employees into at-will employees, meaning due process for firings out the window. And this this would ensure that, well, we make patronage great again because the only people who'd be able to keep their job in a Trump administration we know are going to be the loyalists. And how do we know? Because they've told us. Uh, they've told us with the Heritage Foundation and their Project 2025. And that's and that's why, again, you know, yesterday we talked with former Congressman uh, Bob Ney about the Thomas Etzel piece. That's why I've asked Tony Kark to come talk with us. Tony is the executive director of Accountable.us, Accountable.us. Uh, I guess it's accountable.us is the website if you want to check that out. Tony, thanks for taking time for us. Well, thank you for having me. So, you know, I'm in this moment and I'm looking at this Thomas Etzel opinion piece over at the New York Times yesterday, and I can't help but go, well, Magellan, you finally found what the rest of us have known for a couple, for at least 10 years, that the Heritage mm -hmm. Foundation, the moneyed interests, all of the, the machinery that's been built to push the conservative agenda is there and has been for a long time. Congratulations for finding that. Um, do, you, do, you, do you follow me? I do. And I think what's 
interesting is how brazen the conservative movement has been about telegraphing exactly what they're going to do. Uh, and I think we should believe them. It's pretty frightening how sophisticated and how ready they're getting to enact an agenda on day one, should there be a, a new administration come 2025. And they've laid it out. And, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time. You know, the, a couple of days after the Heritage Foundation issued their Project 2025 and laid out some of the ground rules in the hiring process, I immediately said, this is this is danger. Uh, this is making patronage great again. This is going to privatize the federal government into the hands of the of the profiteers. And and I got pushback. No, no, this is just, you know, them, you know, conservatives, you know, talking about. No, this is dangerous stuff, isn't it? Yes, and I think what is particularly alarming is just how sophisticated it's being from its funding. Like they're well connected to a lot of the big money uh, people on the right. They have the policy analysis that's going into this. Like this Project 2025 is about a 900 page manifesto of what they're going to do in every facet of the government come day one. And it's also about figuring out who the people, like you were talking about, um, that they're going to put in to enact this agenda. You got to remember, under the Trump administration the last time, there were, I think they saw there were some people in the way that would stop them from doing the agenda that they wanted to do. Now they're trying to think before that comes, like, what were the obstacles and how can we remove them now? So this is happening right now. I think everyone should be pretty alarmed with the sophistication, the dedication, and the just the sprawling network and how they're all interconnected people are working to try to enact this extreme conservative agenda. Well, I come back to it and I use the word patronage on purpose because this would make mm -hmm. a hiring process with loyalty to the president, not loyalty to we the people. And I think there's a, there's a huge difference there. Sure. Uh, you're going to have people who and, and the fear is that these are going to be well educated, um, you know, capable people put into positions uh, where they could do real damage by being loyal to one person instead of all of us, uh, where, you know, once we privatize the federal government, uh, I don't I don't know how we get it back. Right. And you have to think if you look at the Trump administration, how it was like the, the last year, of the Trump administration, you saw President Trump sort of understand and, and start to work some of this about replacing uh, some of the, the the people throughout the the entire government. That's what it's going to be like from the start. So we're starting off where he ended off. Um, should that happen? And it's just a whole different ball game and the people that are working this have been really spending time thinking about this meticulously about how they can impact and impose this agenda on the rest of us and like i said it's it's just from every facet of the of the federal government they've been thinking through like what levers of power they can pull and who can be the, who are the right people to be in there to do it yeah when i bring up schedule f a lot a lot of people their their faces glaze over like what do you mean uh, you know, this is a Trump. This was a Trump era want uh, to be able to go in and fire anyone in the federal government they want, because right now those federal employees have have union protection. You can only be fired for due process. You had to do something wrong, not just because you disagreed with the president or you put something, you know, on Twitter that he didn't like at three o'clock in the morning, but you had to actually do something in employment to be to be fired for. Uh, as where what they want to do is just, hey, you're not, we don't, we don't, we don't, we got someone that we want to replace you with. You're all fired. Uh, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. And they, I know the Biden folks are pushing f through with this rule. I don't know that if Trump gets elected, that they honor it. Well, I think that the point that you're raising is really critical about who is the loyal, who are you working for? You're working for the American people. You're working to defend the Constitution. That is, this Project 2025, these extreme conservatives are, are flipping that on its head and saying, no, it's the agenda of one person. And that is scary. And this is undermining our democracy. It undermines the democratic institutions that we have. There's a reason that we set up the system that the way that we did to provide checks and balances, to make sure that the government and the people that are serving in it are doing it to, for the, the well-being of everyone, not just to make money for themselves, or for the ideological um, reasons of, of one person in particular. Uh, I brought up a moment ago the state policy networks. Every state in this country has a right-wing think tank, and they're all interlocked together. Heritage Foundation's part of that uh, as well. 
Uh, I look at the money that's being spent on all of these conservative institutes at universities across the country that soil the good name of these colleges. Again, spewing out a lot of this uh, this well thought out anti democratic drivel. That that again, if Trump gets to be president again. I fear they they are full tilt ready to to take on and people like Leonard Leo who was instrumental in in packing our Supreme Court. I don't think most people, the average working person, gets just how sophisticated this network and how intertwined this network of money and billionaires and and these groups. I don't think people get just how intertwined they are. Can you walk us through some of of how you see it? Sure. So I, I think most people, if you're not following very closely, might not even know who Leonard Leo is. And he he was an operative that was very influential in make, taking over the courts and making them the extreme right wing um, version that, that they are now. Um, he, a couple of years ago, received a one point six billion dollar donation basically to use as as he sees fit. And he's using that money, as we're showing through our research and other people are reporting on, to fund these extreme right wing groups. And it's it's a matter of trying to impose an agenda on America that couldn't be done legislatively. So it's using the courts, it's using other mechanisms to try to undermine our democratic institutions, uh, use the court system to get the the policy um, fights, the policy consequences that they're looking for, whether it's a national abortion ban, cutting regulations so that like the wealthy and big corporations get you know get more profit while it's hurting everyday Americans. All of that is happening and in, in the funding source behind that is, you we're finding is being connected to to Leo um, and all, all of his um, uh, his business associates. So he's been a little bit behind the uh, under the radar. He, um, we're trying to show what the agenda is that he's trying to impose and how he's doing it to just make sure that people know how dangerous this is. You know, I go back to the uh, the founding of the Heritage Foundation, uh, which, as I understand, came out of the Powell memo. Uh, Lewis Powell, the, the soon to be right. Supreme Court justice back in the early 70s, wrote a treatise on how to save free enterprise. And it was all about destroying, I think, in my view, destroying democratic institutions that made working people, well, a prosperous working people. Uh, and it's been very, very successful. I mean, they have taken over media. They have taken over uh, universities. They've taken over uh, all of the think tank space, the legislative space. They've really run the gamut of, of that playbook. And again, I come back to most most people don't know that this is all part of a well-coordinated, well-funded, uh, well-thought-out scheme uh, to get us on the page with them, which is why, you know, I point out the reason I keep bringing this up is I, I think it's important because, you know, when talk radio is dominated by right wing voices, when cable news is dominated by right wing voices and you don't see equal power on any other side, um, there's a reason for that. And it comes down to the amount of money that we're talking about, that they are investing in being in our eyes and ears all the time. That's right. And I think, like I said, they're, they're coordinating now. Like, for example, Leonard Leo, we just did a report and showed that um, between Leo and his connected groups and like the Coke network, I'm sure people remember the, the Cokes from uh, back a few years ago, the money that's going to these Project 2025 groups, it's about $50 million. So it's very well financed. And it, it's just sprawling. I think just the nature and the, the depth of what's going on here so that it's like, the, the arguments that they're making are being funded by the, the same donors that are going to the elected officials or the, that are funded by the same donors. And we're getting the agenda that the, these donors and the extreme right are pushing for. It's like every step of the process, they are behind it and they are pushing it. You know, I've had people you know, claim to me and, and look, I, I don't disagree that this election, this election really is about do you believe in democracy or don't you? Uh, are you OK mm -hmm. with an authoritarian kind of government? And this is the kind of stuff that you get in those authoritarian governments, isn't it? Yes. And it, and we said, like, again, how we were set up as the United States of America, checks and balances. This, this Project 2025, this push by the extreme right to basically impose their will is, is to undermine those checks and balances, to get rid of um, regulations, to just to let like the the well off and corporations pretty much do whatever that they want and also just impose you know an ideological agenda that like a few rich 
or well-connected people want on America that hasn't been successful. It's unpopular. And it's just, it's not anything that Congress would be able to pass. So they're finding other ways to do it. So what do we do about this? I mean, it's the last line of questioning I've got for you, because look, you know, uh, the, you know, I used to say that, you know, while they have all the money, we've out procreated them. Uh, there are more of us. And if we vote the right way, uh, we throw the bums out. Maybe we've got a shot. Uh, I don't know that I'm, I'm so confident in that much anymore. Uh, but what do we do? Well, I think first, and what we're trying to do from Accountable is a lot of this has been, like we were talking about behind the scenes, it's been on, you know, in the shadows. We're calling that out and trying to, we want to give the information to, to the people so that they know that this is happening and that they, and to raise the stakes to say, look, this is serious. We should believe them when they tell us what they're going to do. They've written it out, here it is in black and white. You can read it for yourself. And we're, we're showing these connections to make sure that people are drawing the, the, the inferences and the, and the consequences of what's going on. Now, we, you know, I think that is the first step and that is the role that we as, at Accountable.us can play. And hopefully that this information getting out through other platforms and people just being aware and educated and realize this is going to impact me personally. I think when we have these com conversations about democracy and this um, sort of theoretical debate, like what does that mean? And trying to make it real for people's lives, like what does that actually mean to what's going to happen to you? Uh, I think that makes it more real for people and it raises the stakes and, and shows that this is serious. Yeah. No. I, and and what, what do you want? What Where can we go get more information? What should we be looking for? Um, you know, the average person, as I said, I don't think knows just how well coordinated this is. So breaking it down, uh, when we see it, how will we recognize it? Uh, well, first, I would say, I, you know, we have a lot of information on our website about this at accountable.us, where there is a concerted effort among progressives just to raise the stakes that to get this information out, like talking through, you know, through media, through, through other platforms, just to get the word out here. But um, this is becoming, this is a five alarm fire for our democracy, and it's an all hands on deck moment that that is a call to action, and, and we just want to make sure that people have the facts that, that they can use to, to know what's what's at stake here. There you go. As my grandfather always said, if a rich guy is going to take a buck out of his pocket to tell you you don't need something, you better spend two to get it. Well, the rich guys are spending over two billion of those dollars right. uh, to get what they want. Uh, what are we willing to do to save our democracy? Uh, Tony, I appreciate you taking some time for us. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you so much. Uh, good stuff. Tony Kark, Executive Director of Accountable.us. Check out their website, Accountable.us. We'll get links out on social media. You can take a look at that. What are your thoughts? Uh, are you seeing the kind of propaganda on social media, on cable news, uh, with your right-wing bloviator on your local radio? I want to hear about it. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Back after this. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So yesterday on the program, we spoke with Jess Piper from Missouri about the, how badly the Show Me State is attacking public education, as well as gutting their child labor laws, and, and on top of that, um, wanting to do away with their corporate income tax, because guess what? It, they think it'll trickle down to everybody else. Uh, and today I see a guest column by AFT President Deb Howes pointing out uh, in the New Hampshire Seacoast Online that that state, with its voucher program, which evidently is administered by some private children's scholarship fund, uh, evidently, according to her, um, the people who are administering this are, quote, treating its data as a nuclear secret and will not release the information. And look, here's the thing. You can't audit what you can't see. Uh, but to be honest, we already know. I don't think we need to even see the, the data. Uh, the people who are getting these, these wonderful vouchers, these golden tickets, most of the time we know that it's a slush fund for the rich and powerful, and they're lining their pockets. Uh, now I turn my sights to my home state of Ohio, so I've asked Melissa Cropper to come talk with us. She's president of the Ohio Edu Federation of Teachers, also secretary treasurer of the Ohio AFL CIO, or as I call my former home state of, of Ohio as you know, ground zero for the attack on public edu education. Melissa, thanks for taking time for us. I'm glad to join you and thanks for addressing the topic. 
So I look at this and, you know, this is not new. None of this stuff is new, but we're finally seeing more and more reports coming out that, you know, these golden tickets, these wonderful things, these opportunities that we were going to give these these poor children don't seem to trickle down to them. No. And, you know, for for a long, long time, uh, Senate President Matt Huffman has tried to expand vouchers in Ohio and we were successful and slowing down that expansion, stopping that expansion for a long time. But in this last budget cycle, he was successful in pushing universal vouchers in the state of Ohio. And now we're seeing this you know, dramatic increase as um, draining, absolutely draining money from our public school system and in a much deeper way than it had previously. It's always been a problem, but now it is a much expanded problem. No, I, in fact, I, I have relatives still in, in Ohio and recently had a conversation with one of them and saying, look, uh, the reason your local school is is struggling, the reason they keep coming and asking for levies to raise taxes to be able to support the, the local schools is because they're they're dividing the, the education money into, well, what's going to be left in your local public school and what they can line the pockets of the already well to do with these voucher schemes are not about choice. It's about destroying your local public school. And I think they're starting to get it. And I hope a lot of other people are, too. Well, I hope so, too. I mean, Senate, Senate President Huffman has not been shy in saying when people have said, yeah, we're concerned that this is going to drain resources from the public school system. Um, he's not been shy in saying that he doesn't care. I mean, I think that is his intent is to drain resources from the public school system. He'd be glad to see just a private school system in the state of Ohio. And just, you know, there have been attempts for what we call backpack balls, so that you just put a voucher in everybody's backpack, let them go to school wherever they want to go to school, et cetera. And again, there is no interest on his part or the part of many of his colleagues in fully funding a fair school funding formula in Ohio. Um, you know, we, we've been successful in getting the first two phases of a fair school funding formula passed, not because of the Senate. The Senate uh, tried to stop that, but we were able to get those first two phases passed. But we still have not fully funded our public school system in Ohio. Yet we have over $600 million going to private schools, and that number is growing all the time. Yeah, but here's the thing. And this is you said something a second ago that that caught my ear. You said, you know, he wants to give people a backpack of money so that they can kids, send their kids wherever they want to go. Uh, I don't know that that's reality. Uh, look, you could give them a backpack of money if it's not enough to get them to be able to go to anywhere else and you don't have the extra income to be able to make up the difference. What good is a backpack of money for education if there's nowhere to spend it? Yeah, correct. You're absolutely right. And that begs the question then on what kind of system are we actually creating? I mean, originally when vouchers were brought up as a concept, uh, lawmakers always hid behind. They were trying to do this for uh, low-income children who were trying to escape, you know, failing schools. That was always the rhetoric that we heard. Of course, we always pushed back and said, you should be fully funding our schools so that they can give the resources to these poor children so they didn't feel the need to escape. But there's no pretense anymore that this is for poor-income students. The fact is that a lot of people who are taking these vouchers already attend to private schools. Their children already attend to private schools. Uh, they had no intent of ever going to a public school. And it's not going to the to just poor children. It's going to wealthy children, as you said. And we're going to end up creating um, a whole separate class of schools for wealthy students that, as you indicated, poor students still aren't going to be able to access because the amount of money you're giving them is not enough to fully cover tuition. No, because, you know, they have, they've, they've made it sound like you're going to get this golden ticket. And this golden ticket is the, the key, the gateway for your kids to get the same education as, uh, as the Obamas or the Trumps or, or the Buffets or the, the Bezos' kids, when the reality is, is it, it doesn't. And I remember a number of years ago, right, when, you know, the voucher issue came up in my state where I live now in Pennsylvania, where the state senator who introduced the first, first voucher bill here came on this show and told me right to my face that this golden ticket would cover all of the costs. I would be able to send my kids to the Abington Friends School in Philadelphia, where kindergarten's like 40 grand a year, and it would cover the school and transportation. And, and I'm going, Senator, you didn't even read your own bill because it's not what it says, but it's what they sell, Melissa. It's what they want working class people to believe that they're getting something special when the reality is, is well, they're getting taken. They are. I, I totally agree with you. And again, this is part of the problem of, of being in a completely gerrymandered state. They don't have to be responsible. They, uh, they, they have no qualms about hiding what the, you're hiding behind these kind of narratives. 
and not being responsible to the people who, who they're supposed to represent because, again, we're such a gerrymandered state, and that's a whole other issue, though, that we yeah, can Yeah, but here's the thing, and this is what we talked about yesterday. This should be an issue that Democrats, that labor leaders should be going into rural communities and talking about going, look, that local public school, that is the, what ties your community together, that thing that unites your community, that is under attack by these bad ideas. They're literally stealing from your children and these small schools and these rural communities, they're all going to be screwed in the very new future. And your kids are going to drive hours on buses just to get somewhere else. It is a bad system. This should be a winning issue in those places. You would think it would be, but again, this is where nothing is isolated in and of itself. And this is where all these culture war issues come into play also that the Democratic Party and right-wing party is using against us, trying to pretend like our schools are doing things that they're not doing. So dividing dividing these small communities in that way. And the next step we see in this voucher battle, you know, right now is giving a voucher to students to attend private schools. And like you said, you don't have a whole lot of private schools in rural areas, but now there's attempts in the capital budget to actually put money towards capital improvements and towards building private schools in those in those rural areas. So that's the next phase of this is you create you create this voucher system so that people get this money, you get people to buy into that. Then you create this culture war where you're saying that public education is grooming your children for all kinds of evil, horrible things. And then you say, okay, by the way, well, we're not going to put money in the budget so that we can we can build these small private schools in your rural areas so you too can escape these evil public schools. It's all part of the narrative that they're pushing out there to try to divide parents from teachers, the communities from the public schools that they've always had and to create a whole new elitist system of education. Now, you as as head of the teachers union, uh, the Ohio Federation of Teachers there in Ohio, obviously your job is uh, to give voice to teachers, uh, not just public school teachers, but all teachers. Uh, and I understand you guys have had a lot of success in organizing uh, these charter schools as they come on board, which I think is important. I think workers, you know, I hear it said all the time, you know, a, a teacher's working conditions are a student's learning conditions. And I think we all should want the best for both. Uh, so I, some of the victories I've seen you have and some of the teachers have, I think are important. They absolutely are important. And again, I think people questioned us when we started to organize charter schools, but all workers deserve rights. All workers have deserve to be treated fairly. And as long as we have students in charter schools, we wanna make sure that we have quality teachers in the schools. And the best way to drive quality in a system is to organize that system, unionize that system, because then you have teachers who are getting good benefits, who are getting good pay, who can then uh, have their ideas brought to the table. It can either bring quality to that charter school, which helps the whole education system, or shut down that private, that public school, or that, sorry, that charter school, if they are not meeting up to the demands of the collective bargaining agreement. But we firmly believe that all teachers everywhere have the right to a, to a contract. Because here's what I'm looking at, and, and you know, I'm looking well down the road to where uh, I've, I've had conservatives explain to me their vision for the future for education, and it is all privatized. Uh, and as you pointed out, every kid's going to have a backpack of cash. Uh, they can go to a charter school. They can go to a religious school or they can be homeschooled. Uh, I've heard that. I don't know that that's happening yet in your state, but that backpack full of cash follows them wherever, home or or in, in one of these other venues. And it's my hope that, that well, we don't allow that to happen. But in the place... Right. I mean, our constitution calls for a system of common schools. And when you start doing that, just putting money in the backpacks of students, there's no financial stability. There's no long-term planning for what a school system could look like. You don't know from year to year what kind of money you have coming in because that money's not going to the school. It's going to individuals. So as you indicated earlier, then what happens is, uh, well, we've got some people who don't want other people in their schools. So let's raise the tuition here high so those students can't come to school here and we can create our own little world, which is really, you know, what private schools were about to start with anyway, right? When to separate themselves from the public school system and create their own space. And now we're just going to have these all these kinds of, uh, like I said, private entities that are teaching whatever they want to teach with no accountability to anybody using, pro using public tax dollars and no common system of schools where, by the way, still 90% of our students attend public schools. So what happens to those 90%? And there's just all kind. Of, it's one of those ideas that if you don't scratch beneath the surface, it might sound like a good idea. Well, yeah, let's just let people choose where they want to go, but it doesn't work. 
just like the trickle down theory of economics you were referring to before, it doesn't work either. No, and I think it's important to explain that so people understand long term, these short term kind of uh, of gimmicks that they sell, like you know, any Madison Avenue product uh, or PR firm would sell you, you know, whatever. Uh, they sound great until you put it into action and and what it looks like down the road. And privatized education looks like uh, people who have resources, their kids are going to get the education that they need and want. And the working class kids like mine. Well, I guess we're going to put them into the workforce because I'm looking at states like Indiana. I'm looking at states like Iowa, Arkansas. I'm looking at the gutting of child labor laws and the repeal of the 20th century going, I don't know that this looks great for working class kids. I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And that's why we have to protect our public school system. Again, this is what the Constitution calls for, a system of common schools. This is what binds communities together. As you said before, especially in our small communities, this is the, the school is often the hub of that community. Um, this is, you know, this is what the foundation of our society, our, our de- democracy is all about, which, again, that brings up questions on. Do we really, do some people in this country really want democracy or not anyway? But this is what the public school system is about, is, is providing a high quality education to every student. And when we put money into vouchers, we're denying that opportunity to our students. We're taking money away instead of putting that money into meeting the resources of each of those schools and making each of those schools a high quality school, we continue to drain money from that public school system and put it into a private system where they can choose who their students are, where they can choose to discriminate against certain classes of people if they want to discriminate against certain classes of people, where they don't have to be accountable to things that public schools have to be accountable, where they can teach whatever they want to teach. This is not what our country was founded on. This is not the kind of public, the kind of education system that, 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 that I believe the bulk of people want. Um, it may come to a point in time where we too have to put this, this on a ballot like we have to do with so many other democracy issues anymore. We may have to at some point in time say this is a ballot initiative too. Every time it's been on a ballot in a state, people have voted down vouchers. It is not the way to go for our education system. I'm with you, but you know, the final thought I want to get in on this because I think education, uh, especially public education, is a lot more than just individual. Uh, I think uh, the, the the institution of public education is what binds communities together. I think it's that thing that 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 commonality that draws us together and teaches us about democracy, teaches us how to to get along together more than just reading, writing and arithmetic, but so much more of the social and and the interaction that comes from being part of a community. I think that's that's the tr- true part of what public education has been able to do. And there are some who don't want that because they're afraid of what the future of this country is going to be. And they're they're, they're in their narrow, uh, blinded world. And that's not the place I want for my kids. I couldn't have said it better myself, Rick. I mean, like you said, that our schools are the place where students learn how to get along with different people, um, uh, how to how to work as a community etc. And again, I want to be very clear in saying it's not that we are opposed to private schools. People have the right to choose to go to private schools. If they want to go to private schools for whatever that reason. I is. just don't want to pay for it. C- correct. The question is who pays for it? We have an obligation to pay for a public school system for everybody. And it's just egregious that right now, the state of Ohio, as well as many other states are choosing to take money away from the 90% of students who choose to go to a public school and put it into a private education. It's just wrong. Now, I don't want to pay for it, and I also don't want my children's opportunity to be lessened uh, and not to pay for it as well. So for me, a bad idea all the way. You want to allocate some new money for that that's over in a separate pot? Great, but do not divide your local pot. And this is what I told my relative. Look, you could get another billion dollars of education funding uh, if you just drop this this idiotic divide and conquer, but that's what it's about. It's truly about conquering. But Melissa, I appreciate you taking some time for us. I hope you'll come back and share some more as this continues down the road. Thank you, Rick. It's enjoyed being on with you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Melissa Cropper, she is the president of the Ohio Federation of Teachers, also secretary treasurer there of the Ohio AFL CIO. Want to hear your thoughts? What's going on in your neck of the woods? Are you seeing the same kind of divvying up of the education pot and well, Education Incorporated getting their greedy hands on it. Email me, Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1989. 
That was the day that the United Mine Workers of America called for a strike against the Pittston Coal Company. Negotiation with the miners who worked in Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky had drug on for 14 months. The company had canceled health care for retired miners, along with miners with disabilities and widows, and also was not paying previously agreed to payments into a retiree benefit fund. 2,000 miners walked out of the mines and onto the picket lines. The company brought in replacement workers. The union was committed to peaceful protest, but the strike also drew a large number of other miners to the cause who supported the strike in wildcat actions. As many as 40,000 wildcat miners walked the lines in support of the strike. Angered over the use of scab labor, some of these picketers participated in actions like using jack rocks, a line of nails welded together to puncture the tires of company vehicles. In all, 4,000 people were arrested during the strike. The strike stretched on from days to weeks to months. At the time of the strike, current AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka was president of the United Mine Workers. When a newspaper reporter asked him how long the workers could hold out on the strike, he responded, one day longer than Pittston. Many friends from labor came to Appalachia to support the strike, including famed farm labor activist Cesar Chavez. A nearby campground became known as Camp Solidarity as a base for these friends. Women supporters formed a group called the Daughters of Mother Jones and staged support actions, including a 36-hour sit-in at the Pittston Coal headquarters. The strike ended in February of 1990 with the miners winning some, but not all, of their demands. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got to tell you, think about what a privatized education system would look like in this country. And this is this is what you know. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, as a working class person, with not a lot of extra resources, I, I, we possibly could find a way to pay private tuition, depending on where this is. But in the world that conservatives want to seem to want to take us, um, it's going to be the haves versus the have-nots. It's going to be the people who are able to navigate a privatized system and, and be able to do the right things. Because I love the people who tell me, well, you know, the public school, it indoctrinates our children. While they're talking about, we want religious schools so that we can indoctrinate our children. And, and I've always said, you know, religion should be one of those things you teach at home. You want to send your kids to a, a religious school? You, you can do that. No one's saying you can't, but I'm not paying for it. And my and children, the rest of the children, shouldn't have to pay for it by diminished investment in the local public schools. I'm a believer in our, our public schools are, are what bring us together. Uh, it's that thing that, that, that brings community together especially now when I think we need it the most. But what the right has realized, is they've commodified everything. And this is where I started today, talking about the Powell memo and, and defending capitalism and that everything, everything is a commodity. Everything should be done for a profit. They believe that teachers and educators and, and everyone only do, do what they do for profit. And, and this idea that we're going to have schools competing against each other. You know, underfunded schools competing against each other with teachers who, who, who don't have the resources to, to get the things that they need in their classrooms. Uh, somehow they think that's going to be a positive way forward. And I say, look, you know, I want what, what our upper crust has. I want our kids to have smaller class sizes, more experiential learning, uh, better resources, better opportunities, more paths uh, to, to attempt and to succeed, as opposed to, well, uh, the, the old-fashioned grill and drill. Uh, I'm not opposed to the idea of alternative schools and, and, and that, but still in the hands of the public. Because once you start putting a profit motive to things, well, education becomes secondary. And it's all about how can we squeeze that quarter tight enough to make the eagle scream and line our pockets. And we've seen this. And the fact that in a lot of states that have these vouchers, there, there is no accountability. 
Uh, so for me, not not going the route of privatizing our education system. And look, I've, I've found very few people who think this is a great idea. Even in poverty areas where the schools have struggled. Now, how do we fix our system in the places that need help? We fund them. Seems pretty simple to me. But we'll see. We'll see where it takes us. Uh, some interesting news coming out of Al Alabama. Oh, Mobile Hospital there. Uh, since the S state Supreme Cro Court ruled that frozen embryos are people and that, um, you know, they're children and uh, hospitals can, can be sued or jailed or whatever it is now, uh, they've, they've stopped providing in, virtual, in vitro fertilization services uh, in the labs. It's it, done. And this is a mission accomplished for the, the ultra far right conservatives who seem to be controlling the, the party. And look, you wonder, you know, who really is controlling the Republican Party? And I go back to the 2016 election where there was a lot of Russian propaganda. And I look at House Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Michael McFaul, a Republican who was being interviewed. And he said, I think Russian propaganda has made its way into the U.S., unfortunately, and it's infected a good chunk of my party's base. And the reason I bring this up is because my kids have come to me and said, but dad, you know, they want a bad TikTok. And I say, yeah, I, I think it's not a bad idea. I think we should be banning foreign influences in our media overall. Uh, when we were in the midst of the Cold War, you didn't see the Soviet Union having a TV channel of its own. You didn't see the Soviet Union having direct access to the, to the minds of the next generation. They weren't able to put video crack in every bedroom in America, but yet the Chinese Communist government, they seem to have figured that out, thanks to TikTok. So when you've got the House Foreign Relations Committee chair saying, you know, Russian propaganda infecting my party, begs the question, what are you going to do about it? Well, answer, nothing. Because... <laughs> Um, has he looked to his right and to his left? Does he see that his party has been invaded? Does he pay attention to what is being, being spewed by his colleagues? The fact that, as we've been talking about Trump possibly returning to power, using this Schedule F to fire federal workers, to bring in, make patronage great again, and bring in all these, these little Trumpian loyalists to, to do their dirty work of corporate America, basically making the Powell memo, the, uh, the religious text of corporate America, his party is all on liberties. They're liberties. And they go, you know, that's what happens to felons. It's what we do to felons. Maybe, maybe they should have thought of that before they committed a crime. But here, this is a guy who defended him himself by and the moneyed interests trying to privatize our government. I want to hear about it. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program? Audio podcast, always there for your availability. Also, freespeech.org. That's where you can get the video. Uh, love to hear it. As all, don't care. Generally don't care uh, about what RFK says, but he did say something interesting. Uh, these January 6th defendants as activists who have been stripped of their constitutional liberties. Their liberties. And I go, you know, that's what happens to felons. It's what we do to felons. Maybe, maybe they should have thought of that before they committed a crime. But here, this is a guy who defended him himself by saying that, yeah, I hung out with Jeffrey Epstein. It's because I live in New York. Uh, and, you know, you run into everybody in New York. He says, uh, you know, I know Jeffrey Weinstein. I know Roger Ailes. I know O.J. Simpson. Basically, everyone that you could name that you go, maybe you should not name drop that. He knows Bill Cosby. In fact, Bill Cosby's been to his house. Maybe not the best, maybe, maybe not the best name dropping you can do. Uh, but that's, that's enough for RFK Jr. I want to hear your thoughts. Are you concerned as I am about about the future of this country? 
uh, about Project 2025 and the Heritage Foundation and the moneyed interests trying to privatize our government? I want to hear about it. Email me, rick at the show.com. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Taylor. Excitement's building just ahead of today's solar eclipse. It's the first total eclipse here since 2017 and will be the last until 2044. Thousands of people are planning to travel to see the historic event. Taking pictures of a partial eclipse with your phone could damage your eyes and your camera. Monday's eclipse will be total for a narrow strip across a dozen states or so, but in areas where the eclipse is partial, extra precautions should be taken before taking pictures. You'll need to use the same material used in eclipse viewing glasses to put over your phone's lens. There are also smartphone filter kits available online. The Biden administration is proposing a new plan to slash student loan debt for more than 30 million borrowers. The plan would affect those with runaway interest, borrowers who have been paying on loans for 20 years, and those who qualify for income-driven repayment plans. The White House estimates the plan could eliminate accrued interest on 23 million borrowers' unpaid balances. Lisa Taylor, NBC News Radio. Excitement is building just ahead of today's solar eclipse. It's the first total eclipse here since 2017 and will be the last until 2044. The path of totality, where the sun is completely covered by the moon, will occur in over a dozen states. Thousands of people are planning to travel to see the historic event. Taking pictures of a partial eclipse with your phone could damage your eyes and your camera. Monday's eclipse will be total for a narrow strip across a dozen states or so, but in areas where the eclipse is partial, extra precautions should be taken before taking pictures. You'll need to use the same material used in eclipse viewing glasses to put over your phone's lens. There are also smartphone filter kits available online. The Biden administration is proposing a new plan to slash student loan debt for more than 30 million borrowers. The plan would affect those with runaway interest, borrowers who have been paying on loans for 20 years, and those who qualify for income-driven repayment plans. The White House estimates the plan could eliminate accrued interest on 23 million borrowers' unpaid balances. I'm Lisa Taylor. More than 80 million Americans depend on AM radio each month for news, weather, and emergency information. A new bill in Congress would make sure AM radio remains in cars. Because when cell and Internet services are down, this free service could be your only lifeline. Text AM to 52886 and tell Congress to support the AM Radio for Every Vehicle Act. Message and data rates may apply. You may receive up to four messages a month, and you may text STOP to STOP. This message furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters. Are you looking for a good union job? The Inland Empire's 14,000-member Strong Teamsters Local 1932 has opened a training center to get working people trained and placed in open positions in public service clerical work and in jobs in the logistics industry. This is a new opportunity to advance your career and raise standards across the region. Visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. KCAA Radio, Loma Linda, where no listener is ever left behind. Indy's Demolition in Huntington Park encourages listeners to shop small business and buy local. Buying from small businesses improves the health of our local economy and our nation. Jobs are created, homes enjoy stability, and local businesses support one another. So, before visiting the mega chains and internet super warehouses, think local and invest in your hometown. That important community reminder is from Indy's Demolition. Call 323-835-6710 for Indy's Demolition in Huntington Park. Was your car involved in an accident or just need help with dents? All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers, in business for over 30 years. Their highly trained staff and certified technicians and friendly staff are the best in the business and treat each car as if it was their own. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers are family owned. 
and offer state-of-the-art equipment and tools to ensure optimum results. They use the latest technology in computerized color matching and specialize in frame repairs. With their modern laser measuring systems, they're OEM certified, and they have four locations to serve you. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers offer rental car assistance with free drop-off and pickup services too, and their work has a lifetime guarantee. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers are in Norco, Eastvale, Marino Valley, and in Fontana. Call them at 1-800-61-MAGIC. That's 1-800-61-MAGIC. All Magic Paint and Body Collision Centers. 1-800-61-MAGIC. All Magic Paint and Auto Body says drive carefully. And now, the voices of KCAA with an exciting announcement. Want to hear NBC News or KCAA anywhere you go? Well, now there's an app for that. KCAA is celebrating 25 years and our silver anniversary with a brand new app. The new KCAA app is now available on your smart device, cell phone, in your car, or any place. Just search KCAA on Google Play or in the Apple Store. One touch and you can listen on your car radio, Bluetooth device, Android Auto, or Apple CarPlay. Catch the KCAA buzz in your earbuds or on the streets, celebrating 25 years of talk, news, and excellence with our new KCAA app. Just do it and download it. KCAA, celebrating 25 years. For over a century, AM radio has evolved to meet the needs of our community. More than 80 million listeners depend on AM radio each month. It's also the backbone of the emergency alert system, keeping us safe in dangerous times. A new bill in Congress would ensure this free, reliable service remains in cars. Text AM to 52886 and tell Congress to support the AM radio for every vehicle act. Message and data rates may apply. You may receive up to four messages a month, and you may text stop to stop. This message furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters. 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. Okay, the San Bernardino County Sheriff up in the Victorville substation. And um, so this Ryan Gaynor, how old was he? 16. 16 years old, so he was rather young. Um, and he was shot three times with three rounds. <coughs> yes. And so what has occurred since then? Um, has there been any sort of attempt at justice of any sort? No, not really. The The San Bernardino Sheriff's Department has refused to name the officers, hold these out officers accountable, release full body cam footage. Basically, the San Bernardino County Sheriff put out a statement basically saying, oh, this just happens. Like, they were following protocol, like, this just happens. Mm. It was, um, Sheriff Discus, I believe is his last